Hi everyone, I'm Brian Gitschlock. I'm a graduate student in the lab of Malik Patel at Vanderbilt. And uh, broadly speaking, we are interested in using uh, cell biology approaches to understand the dynamics of genetic conflict. And uh, with, this is with a particular emphasis on uh, mitochondria. So today I'd like to tell you a little story about some of the work that I've been doing looking at selfish mitochondria. And uh, to get a better idea of, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun on that. Uh, to get a better idea of what I mean by um, selfish mitochondria, uh, a good place to start is by first considering cooperation and how that can give rise to additional units for selection to act on. So uh, as many of you are aware, uh, broadly speaking, life is often organized into a hierarchy of cooperative collectives where on one end of the spectrum you can have independent replicators, on the other end there's uh, you know, social groups, and along the spectrum, there are you know, various instances of individual units that can undergo selection, but can also um, collectively give rise to a larger unit for selection to further act on. Unfortunately though, because cooperation tends to uh, rely on some sort of you know, sharing of resources or uh, you know, making an investment in the benefit of another, it's precisely the type of thing that can be exploited by a cheater or more you know, broadly speaking by a selfish actor. So for example, it's possible to have selfish genes, like in the case of those that give rise to uh, meiotic drive, which gives some gametes a fitness boost at the expense of others. It's also, of course, uh, possible to have selfish cells, for cells to uh, proliferate at the expense of other cells, like in the case of cancer. And then, of course, uh, as I'm sure, again, you're all aware, it's possible to have selfish social animals. So we've seen examples in the literature of animals like, uh, like honeybees, and uh, birds like the uh, monk parakeet, for example, who have, uh, both of which have been observed to uh, parasitize other members of even their own species. And of course, the uh, eukaryotic cell itself is no exception because it uh, arose from the cooperation between different genomes. I'm thinking in particular of the nuclear and the uh, wild type genome, excuse me, the nuclear and the uh, mitochondrial genome. And uh, so the mitochondrial DNA is labeled in green here, so you can see it's uh, distributed around the cytoplasm, and it's a pretty high copy number. And because of that, when we talk about mitochondrial mutations, we don't use terms like heterozygous or homozygous. Instead, we think in terms of mutant frequency. And uh, one other thing to note is that the replication of mitochondrial DNA is not coupled to the cell cycle. And so the mutant mtDNA levels can vary not only between individuals, but also over time within an individual. And if those mutant levels rise high enough, they can pass this critical threshold where even a previously negligible mutation can become pathogenic. So we are interested in kind of understanding what are the principles that allow a uh, mutation in the mitochondrial DNA to behave selfishly to um, propagate at the expense of host fitness. To do this work, we use the uh, nematode system, C. elegans, which is an ideal model system for this kind of work for a number of reasons. In addition to having a really short generation time, as far as animals go, um, it also has, a, as I'm sure you're aware, a really widely available genetic toolkit. And uh, the vast majority of mitochondrial DNA, upwards of 90% of the mitochondrial DNA in this animal is confined to the female germline. And that makes it a really great system for dissecting the, uh, the physiological mechanisms of mitochondrial inheritance. And it has a widely conserved mitochondrial genome. So the vast majority of genes encoded by the mtDNA in this animal are shared across um, the, uh, the metazoan phylogeny, even in, in mammals. And uh, finally, we have a well-characterized mutation in the form of UADF5, which I abbreviate as delta mtDNA. And this mutation uh, knocks out four protein coding genes, which collectively disrupts three out of the five electron transport chain complexes. And so this results in a reduced respiratory rate in animals that carry the mitochondrial mutation, as well as reduced uh, fecundity. So animals with especially high levels of the mutant mtDNA produce fewer progeny and a developmental delay. And so the animals with the highest average levels of the mutant mtDNA are held back at an earlier developmental stage uh, even though all these animals began life as age-synchronized uh, embryos. And despite all of these negative fitness effects, this mutation is able to maintain a relatively high frequency. Usually it represents upwards of 60% of the total mtDNA in the animal. And so to get a better understanding of exactly, of exactly how this mutation is able to sustain these high levels, we sought to 
more uh, thoroughly and more quantitatively characterize its inheritance patterns. So for a neutral allele, you might predict that it would have an equal likelihood of shifting either upward or downward in frequency from one generation to the next. However, with this mutation, the overwhelming trend is a shift toward higher frequency from parent to offspring. And this not only happens you know, between generations, but it happens over the course of development, and more specifically, uh, throughout the, or in conjunction with the expansion or the proliferation of germline tissue. And so if you sample animals from a single generation at different life stages, from embryo to larva to adult, uh, you see the pattern that the mutant mtDNA levels are able to uh, shift upward to high frequency and then uh, stay there when they get there. Okay, so since, uh, as, as you know by now, that this happens at the expense of organismal fitness, you could make the following prediction. You could predict that the wild-type mitochondrial DNA would maintain its fitness advantage over the mutant if you're thinking strictly in terms of organismal level selection because the whole organism, its, its fitness is gonna be uh, dependent in some way on how much wild type versus this you know, selfish mutant mtDNA that it has. And so we, talk, we, we sought to uh, test this prediction by taking animals with only wild type mitochondria and competing them against animals that carry the mitochondrial mutation with a non-competing line as a control where every member of that population has the mitochondrial mutation. And we did this over several generations and what we found is that in the, um, in the non-competing population, as you might expect, the uh, mutant frequency was pretty stable. It maintained about 60% across 10 generations. However, in the competing generation, we saw a remarkable drop in the mutant frequency as the uh, animals with the wild-type mitochondria are, you know, maintain their fitness advantage over the mutants. Okay, so we've, we've done some work to quantitatively characterize the, uh, the competition dynamics between the mutant and the wild-type mitochondria at different levels of selection. And so then we wanted to understand, you know, what are the environmental factors that impact these competition dynamics? And so the approach that I'll take generally is I'll start with an age-synchronized population of larvae, split them up between experiment and control group, and allow those animals to transition to adulthood and expand their germline, and then I compare their mutant mtDNA levels. And what we find is that nutrient status turns out to be a really important uh, determinant of mutant mtDNA proliferation. So we find, for example, that the mutant mtDNA levels are suppressed in animals grown on a calorically restricted diet. However, we can also get more specific and see that the mutant mtDNA levels are also suppressed when we inhibit individual uh, nutrient sensing pathways, like for example, glycolysis and insulin signaling. And so I only have enough time to tell you about uh, insulin signaling. However, the good news is I think it's also the most interesting. So as a brief overview, uh, insulin behaves as a, a nutrient-dependent growth hormone. So in the presence of caloric abundance, insulin binds to the receptor, and that stimulates nutrient uptake as well as anabolic metabolism. So things like cell proliferation, organelle biogenesis, glycogen, and fatty acid uh, biosynthesis. And a lot of the effects of insulin signaling are mediated through the negative regulation by the receptor of the FOXO transcription factors. And so in the absence of insulin signaling, FOXO becomes activated and that allows the cell to mount a transcriptional response to environmental stresses such as uh, nutrient deprivation. And because of the importance across, um, across the tree of life of nutrient sensing, this is a very widely conserved pathway. So for example, DAF2 and DAF16 are the worm homologs of these two respective proteins. And also because of, the, uh, because of how essential macronutrients are for growth and development and reproduction, you might expect, and you would be right, that, the, um, that this pathway, or that nutrient sensing pathways such as insulin signaling play a role as important regulators of germline growth and development and, and reproduction. And so, for example, animals with defective insulin receptor signaling have a smaller germline. This corresponds also to fewer germline nuclei and a strong suppression of the mutant mtDNA levels. And all of these phenotypes, the size of the germline, the number of germline nuclei, and the mutant mtDNA levels are all restored by the loss of, uh, of DAP16 FOXO. And so the, you know, what this is telling us is that the mutant mitochondrial genome is taking advantage of external nutrient status, or at least as perceived through the insulin signaling pathway, to uh, amplify its, its own copy number, basically. And so 
In conclusion, if you take animals that or have wild type mitochondria and those that have the mutant mitochondria, this one's green because it has a mitochondrial disease, and you compete them across multiple generations, the wild type mitochondria confers a fitness advantage on the host. And this manifests in the form of declining mutant MTBNA levels over generations, 